Well, Carol, it, it's almost 28, almost 28 years from the, uh, the time when you and John began leading what would later be known as the Vineyard Movement. Mm -hmm. Now, during that time, as you know, the Vineyard has grown dramatically, not just in this country, the U.S., but all over the world. And yet, with significant growth comes significant danger. The danger that we can actually lose contact with our history and our roots and forget who we are and what God wanted to raise us up to be. And that's one of our purposes for today, to, to go back and catch some of that early history. Uh, the statement is made that when a movement loses its stories, when the stories of a movement are no longer told, it begins to die. And I'm talking about the kinds of stories that are the stories that tell us who we are, tell us who God has called us to be, called, uh, that tell us why God has called us together. Now, of course, so many of those stories are wrapped up in John's life and in your life. And so I'm excited today to, with you, to go back and revisit some of those beginnings and retell some of those great stories. Now, in your book uh, that you wrote short, sometime after John's death, uh, titled The Way It Was, you talk about the early soil, the soil uh, in which the seed of the vineyard was planted and germinated by the Holy Spirit. By soil, I mean the, the heart attitude of the first people that gathered together in this very community. And uh, you know, often when we think about a movement being planted, we think of some young energetic people that are filled with vision and expectation and confidence, ready to go out and change the world and change the church. And yet, from what you write and what you've told me other times, uh, it was anything but that. The reality was very different. Tell me a little bit about that. Going to lunch once with an out-of-town guest, and this was after the vineyard started, but it certainly describes what, how it started. Uh, I asked him, all excited, because I had heard about the revival in a certain part of Africa, and I knew he had been a part of it. So I was asking him questions, and um, like, how did the revival start? And he just stopped and looked at me, kind of like you're looking at me right now. He said, it started with a mighty work of God. I said, oh, tell me about it. Tell me about it. And he paused, and he said, he showed me my sin. And it was like, boom. <laughs> Oh, that's revival. That's revival. And that was uh, my experience. That was John's experience. That was just about everybody's experience as, as we formed a group. It was, not, it was not based on anything else. What we had, we were not like the young, triumphant, successful Christians. We were the old, successful teachers uh, and board members and that had just burnt out. We were a bunch of broken people and it was with the realization we missed something. Uh, in a personal, uh, a personal part was uh, when John was first filled with the Spirit seven years before I'm talking about, um, for my sake he walked away from the whole experience. I was so anti-charismatic. And he knew Jesus was still Jesus, but he wasn't going to, you know, get us kicked out of our little safe church. So there was, my, my experience was multiplied a hundredfold as people would come in and they would see where they had blocked God or if uh, their experience of God uh, their experience of God became the norm or the standard and, and there was no allowance for anything being different and everyone had to uh, line up and, and agree to, to all things. And it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because when John left uh, pastoring and went to Fuller to work with uh, uh, Church Growth and School of World Missions, the church just kind of all the people we had led to the Lord and uh, had such wonderful beginnings with, 
everybody became sort of disheartened and and dwindled away and so in the meantime somewhere around then as as I talked about this heartbreaking experience and God showed me my sin and I felt and John was very burnt out too he was tired he was traveling with church growth he uh, like no character issues he was just tired and I think disillusioned disillusioned from just watching what what we had spent seven years on our life not building but being a part of there at the friend church just sort of like dwindling away and he was thinking Lord if it's you why does it make a difference whether I'm there or not if it's you it should go on and on like it's not right that um, the people are dependent on one person their welfare the same way John was thinking this way I was I was having a, a personal experience with God starting with a dream where I woke up speaking in tongues which frightened me because I didn't really believe in it but it made me lose all confidence in my own thinking so I did not go into this what became the vineyard with a lot of confidence I came in with almost no confidence with minus confidence in my own perceptions of things at the, at, while that was going on with me which I did not share with John because I had messed him up so badly the seven years before with my thoughts on the Holy Spirit and how things work so I just thought uh, well I mean I, I know it was the Lord like if this is if this is the Lord he'll have his way doesn't it's not going to take any help from me but uh, John at that time was tired and weak and broken and disappointed I mean Jesus doesn't disappoint but there was always that feeling that when we were first saved something wonderful was going to happen and it had been wonderful in a million different little ways but it was you know it was like wait a minute this isn't it <laughs> where this isn't it like it's now it's now at that point 14 years later and what we had felt we were so excited about the Lord at the beginning and and still excited about the Lord but it had turned into some kind of a, a religion for winners like were they successful you know get a star and the poor suckers that that don't have anything or or don't have the character or there just wasn't any place for the weak it just wasn't any place for the week so it was we were that's the kind of people we came together how it really started that probably I only know so I know when John became a Christian this was back in 63 and he was a musician remember and he uh, he had written some wonderful wonderful arrangements he was an arranger and composer and he had them boxes and files and everything and he understood when God called him that he was calling him like our teacher told us Gunner lock stock and barrel no holds barred mountain style and he didn't think I'm being called to the pastor or to be a, a church leader he's thinking I'm called to Jesus and uh, nothing else nothing else has any place in my life and he's calling me to a different way of life so he in our old station wagon and we had four kids the station wagon he loaded up I saw him loading up all of his uh, boxes out of the cupboard and out of uh, what he used for an office and boxes and boxes of arrangements great arrangements and putting him in the back of the station wagon and I said well, what are you doing he said "Oh, I'm going to the dump so I mean I understood what was happening but he took everything he couldn't t put the grand piano in there but he, took, but he took everything and he took it up to the dump took one of the boys with him maybe a couple of boys and they just shoved it out the back onto the dump 
and came back home. And he wasn't, he didn't do it like, you know, we will see what God does with this great sacrifice. He was just doing it because he felt like God, like there was no part anymore for that in his life. And from this point on, he was going to do whatever God told him, no more, no less. And he wasn't weeping about it. I was weeping about it, but he wasn't. He just said, I'm done with that. Done with that, Carol. And it was like, that's a good thing. So, I knew, even then, I remember thinking about it. Well, you may be done with that, but God's not done with that. And then, uh, as time went by, without ever giving it a thought, God started giving him songs which he would, you know, play at church, you know, just for, or for his friends in the Bible study. He wrote a great song about Bible study and leading people to the Lord afterwards. And um, it, many beautiful, beautiful songs he wrote over the years, but not ever to perform or anything else. So, I mean, that is a seed that was planted that I think resulted in a, a vineyard worship. But how it started uh, practically, in a way, we, the, church was al- the church already had the great hymns of the faith down. They were already there. They were already archived. They were already everywhere. They were already recorded. But nobody, it seemed at then, was just, was just worshiping Jesus in a personal, intimate way. I mean, we already had the, the big thing, the important thing, undergirding it. Now, I often think the vineyard couldn't have been the vineyard without the undergirding of the established church. And I still believe that. We can afford to be intimate and, and kind of focused in one direction because there's the undergirding of the whole church. Well, we, we thought nobody's, you know, can't we just sing to him like we sing to him alone? I mean, what if the whole church just started singing to Jesus alone? As if they were alone, not aware of one another. You know, let's, and Lord, give us songs. Give us songs just for, just for you. Like not about you or for, for, you know, singing to each other about you. But just, just for you. And that's when the intimate, beautiful worship songs started coming. And uh, I don't think it stopped. So that was, that was the beginning of worship. We weren't uh, trying to start uh, like a new type of, Worship and and also let's do it in the in the uh, let's do it in the container which feels natural to us in our culture. Let's don't try to make it sound old or do it a certain way or like who plays the organ anymore anyhow. <laughs> so it was just for the modern what would have been the current media at that time. We became very aware that we had to protect what worship was. Because the concept in many groups and organizations had become where well, you start singing the hymns and it's to get people ready to know that church is about to begin. Or you do a hymn during the offering to, so they're not thinking about uh, what's going on. Or you use a hymn to uh, uh, rev people up and get them ready to deal with God. Um, we had to just toss all that understanding uh, when when the Holy Spirit started, when the Holy Spirit actually started impressing on us the importance of intimacy with God, so we would never use a song, particularly a worship song, to warm people up or get them quiet, uh, or even uh, to get ready for the move of the Holy Spirit. You remember when John would have those? Uh, what we called, uh, com- we call- what did we call it? Uh, lab time. Clinic, clinic, and he would, the people would be coming in with a cookie still in their mouth, and he'd say, all right, everybody, uh, sit down. He wouldn't start, you know, he wouldn't use a song to get them all uh, emotional and focused, and he'd say, okay, people, sit down. Uh, We're going to ask the Lord to come, and he'd say, you know, Lord Jesus, come in your Holy Spirit, and boy, I mean, he would come. But he refused to use worship songs. He would never exploit worship uh, for the sake of anything. 
worship was for Jesus, it was only for Jesus, and it was because he was worthy, not because we had something to say. He's worthy, therefore we praise him and we love him. So that, that became something that had to be protected. And therefore the musicians on a worship band uh, were just musicians on a worship band. Uh, the worship leader was leader in the sense that he leads he leads the worship, but he was not anything special. It wasn't a, t it wasn't a place uh, like to make your name. It wasn't a retirement uh, place for worn out rock and roll stars. or um, It wasn't that kind of a thing at all. They, they had a, a call, uh, and a very important call, a very holy call, to lead the per uh, people before the Lord. And, uh, you know, John likened it for when it was used for anything else, like strange fire strange fire and uh, he, John being a musician himself didn't have a hard time calling the musicians on it when they were trying to focus on themselves. John was reading uh, George Elton Ladd's Gospel of the Kingdom. I'm not sure of the title but it was a view of the kingdom, the already and the not yet. The kingdom visiting and experiencing the powers of the coming age, like it says in uh, Hebrews, right? And, but, and that there is a kingdom, it's not the church, it's the reign and rule of Christ. And he has a right to rule, which was, which was the issue with John. As he was reading, he was reading through Matthew, uh, Mark, one day up at Fuller, just reading through it, and it struck him like he has a right to rule and all we have to do is ask and it's not happening because we're not asking and he's apparently put this on us we have to ask we have a right when someone's sick to ask the king to come the king to come and rule in this situation we have a right and we have the obligation therefore to take the message of the kingdom, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. The good news is we have a king. He has a right to rule. Things do not have to stay the same. We can experience the now, the powers of the coming age. So that basically was what was in his mind and head and spirit as a as, uh, this whole thing began to happen. And uh, it was proven out. It was proven out. We had a little Bible study. And whatever subject it was on, one time it was on uh, the crippled man that was healed. He would teach from the scripture. Then he would ask the king to come. And sure enough, the crippled girl there <laughs> got healed. <laughs> So that's when he came home. We came home afterward and kind of thinking about, sort of silent, stunned, because that was one of the first healings, stunned about what had happened. And he was saying, he was pouring himself a glass of milk in the kitchen. And he said, uh, I think we're on to something here, Carol. He said, I tell the story of Jesus and then I ask him to come and then he does it. It's kind of like tell and show rather than show and tell. And, and just when he said that, um, I tell the story of Jesus and then he comes and does it. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit hit him like a million volts of electricity. And he, you know, the milk went shh. <laughs> Right, right out of his glasses. He caught himself on the counter. And that's what he said. I think we're on to something here, Carol Kay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very simple understanding, but God demonstrating it. Well, our focus as time went on, uh, you know, that, that parable that Jesus tells about... Uh, uh, a friend coming from another city and coming to your house and you don't have anything to give him and so you go find it from the neighbors or so on. Um, we had friends coming from other cities. <laughs> we had 
we had uh, people coming because they were sick. The, the healings had begun, which were not the focus. They were just happening because Jesus was there. We need to get empowered here. He's given us a job to do, and we really don't know how to do it. And that was what it was, like, Lord, we are the church, and you say the church, you tell us to go out and heal. You tell us to go out and cast out demons. Uh, you tell us to preach the gospel to the poor. You tell us to clothe the naked. You know, we need to do our job. We need to be empowered. We're asking. Well, it was at that time, now remember John was already empowered. He had all the elders come up, elders. He had all the grown-ups, <laughs> you know, all 17 grown-ups come up. And, uh, and he did, the, it was very funny, he did that passage uh, <laughs> of the oil on the forehead, the right ear, the right thumb, the right toe, you know. I think it is for the anointing, I forget what it was, the cleansing and anointing for something or other in the Old Testament. But he read the, he actually read the one uh, for the cleansing of leprosy. <laughs> and he had all of us come forward and anointed the forehead, the earlobe, the right thumb, the right toe. And then he read it out, then he gets to the end, and he said, you know, therefore there will be no leprosy. <laughs> You know, and sure enough, not a one of us ever got leprosy. <laughs> but <laughs> the thing is, the Lord understood. <laughs> and um, then there were all those, you know, all of us who could move in a certain amount of healing power, expectation, knowing God would show up when, when we asked. And, uh, but but with the, as the church grew, it became apparent that everybody has to be included. Everybody has to be included. The, the promises aren't just for elders or the older people or some with, that know the scriptures well or the teachers. Or The, the promise is for everybody, men, women, children. If, if you're a Christian, if, you know, if Christ is in you, then you should be doing these things. Even if the character issue isn't fully it isn't like the old holiness thing where only the holy people could uh, move in any kind of power of the Holy Spirit. So it became an issue of everyone getting empowered. And, and that was just about the time that Lonnie came. And there was that major outpouring that just scared most everybody out the door. I mean, literally, they went running out the door, <laughs> Gra grasping their Bibles to their chest. <laughs> And at the same time, there were people running in the door, <laughs> and there were these people laid out in the hundreds and hundreds by then. I think there was probably, the church was probably a couple thousand by then. We were in the gymnasium, and they were just laid out babbling like turkeys and tongues and just a whole scale uh, drenching in the Holy Spirit. Now, some of these people... Uh, we're not the kind of people that you, <laughs> you would really want to walk around all empowered to heal. <laughs> but, it, but it, you know, everybody gets to play. We had just every Tom, Dick, and Harry, <laughs> every, every Tom, Dick, and Harry uh, Christian moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. Kids, teenagers. We didn't know what was going on as people were bouncing up and down. We knew, we knew this. We had prayed for an outpouring of the Spirit of Jesus for empowering for the ministry on the church. We had prayed that way. We had been praying that way. All right, this was the answer to our prayer. Now, this is not what we thought it would look like. Now, we had had certain manifestations personally, you know, but nothing nothing to this nothing at uh, to this degree and it was frightening um, John had a phone call from Tom Stipes the next morning saying John I don't know what's going on there in your Belinda but the Lord told me to call you up and say it's me and that was comforting so he knew it was him now we we learned uh, to ignore the manifestations 
because we knew we didn't really understand, we didn't know, we didn't need to know. We discouraged any philosophizing about what this means, what that means, what, you know, the roaring means, all that. We just discouraged it. It didn't really have anything to do with the end result. Uh, when a baby when a baby is being born, there's a lot of messy stuff going on. But the point is, you don't write about the messy stuff, and this means that, and this means that, or the afterbirth. You write about the baby that's born. So we just consciously, with effort, ignored some of it, tried not to label what this means or that means. Now, every once in a while, a manifestation, uh, a demon would pop up. Now, that we had to deal with. We had to deal with it because this person, that was our call to cast out demons. So when we met a demon face to face, then we would make it leave. By then we knew how to make it leave. It's very clear in the scriptures. And it, uh, it's really an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And any time the Holy Spirit's there in power, uh, darkness is going to get popped up and shown up. The, the problem is in the, when people jump to conclusions that... Sometimes it's just fear or pain or something that you're dealing with and they'll think it's a demon and, and sometimes it's a demon and they'll say this is some kind of a prophetic prophetic dance or demonstration that means thus and so. And when the person has a demon for crying out loud, get rid of it. <laughs> Give the poor sucker a break. That's, that's our call. <laughs>
I remember John spent like a, a month or so writing up this big evangelism plan and uh, got all done with it and was going to present it to everybody. And the Lord said, throw it away. <laughs> I'll do it my way. <laughs> so John just tossed the notes, you know, into the garbage. I mean, that happened over and over. Every time he tried to do something on his own, God just like, put it down, John. Don't bother. I'll do it my way. And in fact, it started out with the Lord saying, uh, I've seen your ministry, John. Now I'm going to show you mine. So those were, I mean, that was so much in his spirit and therefore in all of our spirit. That there wasn't a whole lot of uh, attempt in the flesh to do to do the work of the church. So it looked at the outsiders like, what is it with those people? You know, they're just relaxing, having a good time, and partying around, and then these wonderful things happen. But it was, but it was like, it was, came from that, I've seen your ministry, John. Now I'm gonna show you mine. It came from that. That was the bare essence of our understanding. Someone uh, came and asked John, uh, oh, well, uh, John, uh, how do you, uh, how do you prepare for the conferences? You know, expecting some, you know, great holy thing. You know, I usually uh, watch the six o'clock news and drink a Diet Pepsi. <laughs> but he was telling the truth. They joked like, oh, that's, you know, what a joke. But that's really the truth. That's really the truth. And one time he said to me, we were on our way in England, somewhere in England, and. I was getting my purse and my coat, and we were getting ready to walk over to the conference center. And I said, uh, what are you going to teach on tonight, John? He said, I don't know. I don't know. You know, my hair stands straight. <laughs> because I was not John. <laughs> and he said, oh, the Lord will, the Lord will tell me something. Then he, he said, I'm going to go to the bathroom first. He went in the bathroom and came out, and he said, Lord spoke to me. I said, well, that was fast. He said, he told me that the servants, the servants knew. And that was that, what I think of as one of his greatest teachings on the servants know, which went right along with what we understood, you know, the church to be, the servants. Yeah, I think it was in, uh, it was 1976, probably about July or August. And Peter was there, Peter Wagner and some of the other guys and John, and they were in a huge conference of all Church of God pastors and leaders. And John called me up right after, you know, it was kind of late at night. He called me up and he said, Carol, and he was crying. He said, Carol, he said, we've got to do something about the poor. And I said, uh, okay what and he said I just he said I've been in the the conference and the old evangelist so-and-so who doesn't even have a voice anymore he's blown his voice out shouting all these years and he was calling the people back to the poor reminding them where they came from how they used to go door to door and help people and wash their babies and clean their houses and being poor themselves they would share their little tiny houses with anyone else that needed anything. Um, that's what, that was the soil that they came from. And uh, he said, now you've got your cars and your big buildings and your big houses. And what about the poor? What about the poor? And John said, as that old man spoke in this hoarse, hoarse voice, the people who were all just standing at that point, there must have been five or 6,000 of them, he said it was like a field of wheat. And as he would speak, just under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, their bodies would just sway back and forth. And as he'd say another thing, and they'd just sway back and forth. He said it looked like, like waves of, of wind going over the wheat. He said, he said I, I, it's the most powerful thing I've ever been a part of. And he said, if we ever start a church again, if God ever does that, I want the focus to be the poor. I said, okay, John. <laughs> but 
but that never left, that didn't leave him. That's been a part of it from the beginning. It's, and when the church did eventually start, you know, a few months later, half a year later, I think that was in his heart. And then uh, Monty and Brandy came one day and said, uh, you know, we have a, a neighborhood where the people don't have anything and uh, Brandy just gave away all of our blankets and food. <laughs> and John said, that's good. <laughs> you just keep doing that. So, that, it, so and then uh, Brandy and Monty taught it to others and everyone that's ever been a part of that never stops. You know, the poor we always have with us. And it's, uh, it's our understanding that we need the poor. We need the poor the same way they need people that have. They need Christians and we need the poor. We need to work out our salvation. And there's only two places available in this thing, and it's the haves and the have-nots. So if we decide uh, uh, we don't like the game, then we become the have-nots. <laughs> but that's my understanding. We either take our place, we that have, we take our place and we give away. And that goes with all, all of our Christian life. What we have, we give away. To those that don't have, then they have, then they can give away. So eventually goes over the whole earth. Well, he never seemed to be discouraged with the way things were going. It was uh, simpler than that. Uh, things that I thought, oh, well, John, but it's not the same. It, you know, I thought it would last forever. And he'd just shake his hand at me. He said, Carol, you're an idealist. He said, the, the real things that God have, has done will last forever. But, but you may not be a part of that. I may not be a part of that. A lot of these guys may not be a part of that, but God will have his way. He said, the wind comes, the wind goes. He said, a people movement has a lifespan of about 20 years. And, and you can keep, you have a part in that in the sense that if we pray, always his presence will be with us. But it's not ever going to be just the same way. He said, so don't, you know, don't, uh, don't get it down in your mind that you only recognize one way. He said, and bless what God's doing wherever he's doing it. You know, don't ever let yourself be jealous or envious. Bless what God's doing wherever he's doing it. And let, you know, things will change. That's the way of life, and that's the way God's designed it. So it'll always be wonderful, but it may not be the same kind of wonderful that you recognize or you appreciate. He was always fighting my idealism. Well, he was very practical. John was very, very practical. And he, at the, at the end, uh, he said, like, part of the problem is I'm lasting too long. He said, I have to get out of the way so these guys can will do and take over and do what they have to do. Mm -hmm. I say, oh, don't say that, don't say that. But, you know, he knew what he was talking about. The whole movement that we, of course, didn't know was a movement. We were a bunch of burnt out elders and teachers that realized we'd, we missed it somewhere. We didn't go the whole way. We wanted to let God do it his way. And the first manifestation of that was uh, when we met together, there was a tremendous breaking and conviction of sin and pride and that we all thought we had, we had thought we had so much to say. And we all came to the realization that uh, we'd been talking so much that uh, God didn't have a chance to talk at all. And if he did, it was so foreign, we didn't even recognize it. So there was a great sense of brokenness and that we'd somehow missed the mark and a, a real repentance. And it, it caused a quiet, rather than a getting jived up or something, it caused a, great, a deep quietness to come on the group. And the manifestation of that was usually not the holy laughter type of thing. It was usually a weeping, a deep gut-wrenching weeping. 
And from that, from that, it's like everybody fell in love with Jesus again. Just one at a time in our own quiet way. We didn't talk a whole lot about it. We, we had a big fear, kind of maybe it's the old Quaker hangover of talking too much about what we think and our experience. And, you know, we tried to keep the words to a minimum and keep it kind of intimate between Jesus and us. But, but I know from... Uh, I know from the manifestation of that whole thing, people fell in love with Jesus again. I would like to go out still in love with Jesus and doing whatever the Lord wants, however that, however that manifests itself. Right now I'm working down at the church uh, uh, feeding the hungry um, on, on a certain day of the week, Wednesday. And, I mean, for me, it's perfect since my brain isn't uh, firing on all cylinders anymore. <laughs> I can't keep a thought longer than a few seconds. But yet, I can still feed the poor and I can pray for them. And praying comes from a whole different part of the brain. And I can still pray for whatever they need, whether it's healing and, or uh, some, sometimes they come in demonized from drugs or other reasons or just to pray with hope and I, I notice now these years I have so much more compassion on the really weak, the really needy, the ones that just don't have a chance unless God comes and rescues them. They don't need help, they need rescuing. So it's very satisfying to me because then I can, I can come with all expectation that Jesus will move like he always has. And you know, even though there's a big language difference most of the time, I mean, they, they come sometimes when they don't even want food, they just wanna hang around. They just want to be there because they think, think the Lord's there with all of us down there. And Penny comes and Stephanie comes. and I mean, it's just a good time. And it's doing all the stuff. But uh, th there's no titles there. Be you know, they don't know who I am. If I, if I am anybody, <laughs> they don't know. You know, they don't know the history. They, they just know this, the, these people. These are Christians. They help us. They bring Jesus. So that's how I want to go. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with my life as it is. And if I want to leave a legacy to anybody, I would like everybody to fall in love with Jesus the way I did. And really, that's where it all started, with all of us falling in love with Jesus.